Greetings, everybody. Ambassador Kosh with with you all once again. Got a brand new uh, B5 uh, video, and today we're going to discuss. We're going to go do another character um, discussion, and we're going to be talking about um, the second in command of Babylon Five, uh, Lieutenant Susan Ivanova. And I know my last video was on female her female heroes of the uh, of the 1980s. She was more 1990s or anything, but she fits within. Obviously, she very much fits within the Babylon Five universe. She's one of the major characters, and she is kind of one part of the B Five universe female trinity of really awesome female characters within that universe. And. I'll say it. Some of my favorite scenes, some of my favorite bits from B5 did involve Susan Ivanova. And she was an interesting character herself and everything. And she held her own amongst the cast and she really left an impression upon me as I imagine a lot of people with, that are fans of B5 uh, did as well. So what we know about Susan from the TV show and she Again, and I think this was kind of deliberate, she does make a brief cameo appearance in the um, B5 TV movie in the beginning. Um, a little bit of about her backstory. She was actually uh, born and raised in what is known as the Russian Federation in the B5 universe here on Earth. Um, and the interesting thing about her, she's a very layered character. Um, She's very complex, kind of like, to quote Shrek, she has lots of layers. She's like an onion. And in her way, she was kind of onion-ish. She can make you cry. She could inflict, inflict well, inflict pain, um, metaphorically speaking. But a little bit about her backstory, as I, as I started to say, she was born in the Russian Federation. Um, her parents or anything were, um, as far as we know, you only see her father a couple of times on the TV show itself, and he's uh, not alluded to very much. And the impression that you get is the um, relationship between her and her father is very strained. That's because of some of the career choices that she makes uh, throughout her lifetime. Um, going chronologically, starting with the TV movie in the beginning, you see her in a, uh, like I said, a short cameo scene. She's with another character who's actually her brother, um, who was a fire pilot during the uh, human Membari War. And um, just from that brief, I think it's like maybe a five minutes, well, maybe two, three, I'll say five minute scene, leave it at that. Um, you, get the, you get a real good idea of the relationship between her and her brother. <coughs> <coughs> And I don't quite recall the name of her brother and anything, but you get a good impression of that they have a very good relationship. He's the older brother, she's the younger sister, and he says, I thought the older brother was supposed to look after the younger sister, not the other way around. And she retells this story of when they were kids and they got, I think they got lost in the woods and everything near their home, and she lost an earring. And... It may have, she was young and I think she was sad because she lost the earring and uh, her brother tells her, well, the reason you lost the earring is because eventually we did get found. So the other earring that you lost is lucky. And he's getting ready to ship out or anything to the the front lines or anything in the one of the battles of the Membari, the human Membari war. And Susan takes off one of her earrings and gives it to her bro and um, gives it to her brother and says, here, take this. That way we know you'll come back alive. You'll come back to us. And she's like, I won't wear the other earring until you come back. Um, later on in the movie, you see her brother uh, um, again. And sadly, he dies. And if memory serves, she does talk about this with John Sheridan. She doesn't, I don't think she discusses it with uh, Jeffrey Sinclair. Um, I think it's in one of the later seasons during the um, the Shadow War, and 
the first time you meet her in show and everything is in the uh, second episode. She's not in the pilot episode, which is also kind of interesting. The uh, the the um, second second in command under Sinclair is a uh, woman by the name of Takashima. I don't remember. Uh, Laurel Laurel Takashima was was the uh, second in command uh, character in the uh, pilot, The Gathering. But getting back to Susan. Um, she has a very complex story arc within the uh, first within the four seasons and everything because she does not appear until like the very tail end of season five, like I think this the last couple of episodes of Babylon Five, and in seasons one and two, she's very tough. She's very resilient. She's very no nonsense. She obviously has to be. She's the second in command there on Babylon Five. And um, a little bit more about her backstory, her family story. It actually turns out that her mother was a telepath. Now, I won't go into the telepaths in this video. I'll discuss them at a later point, in particular, the telepaths and the psychor and everything. But it turns out that her mother was a telepath. Um, not a particularly powerful one, but there was a lot of uh, regulation and restriction on how telepaths existed in normal society. And there was um, another character and anything. There were actually two different characters that were both telepaths on Babylon 5. The first one was um, Talia Winters. And the second character was uh, Lita Alexander. And now Lita was actually the first telepath we see on the, um, in the pilot episode, The Gathering. And she has an interaction with Amb Ambassador Kosh. But I'll, when I get to Lita, and she's one of the three female characters I just mentioned, what I call the the uh, female trinity, the strong female trinity of Babylon 5. Um, uh, Susan and um, Talia Winters have a discussion at one of the bars there on Babylon 5, and Susan tells this very heartbreaking, gut-wrenching story about the fact that her mother was a telepath, and there were three different options available to her mother being she was a telepath, she could either one join the psych uh, she could go to prison, or there was a uh, there was a uh, drug, a treatment that her mother could take uh, over time, or every every week and everything, to shut off her telepathic abilities. Well, her mother wanted nothing to do with the psych and she didn't obviously want to go to prison, so she took the treatments. She took the only um, option that was open to her. And over a span of several years, and as Susan explains to Talia, and Talia obviously knows this because Talia Winters is part of Psychor. Um, the treatments have a very adverse effect on her mother. And eventually it drives her mother to the point where her mother sadly commits suicide. And that leaves Susan and her father alone because her brothers already died in the uh, human Membari war. And Susan eventually makes the decision that she's going to join, join Earth Force. She's going to join the military and her father absolutely flips over this. But Susan doesn't particularly care. This is her life. It's her choice. It's her decision. She does what, and she goes through with it. And sadly, it does create a rift between her and her father because her father's already heartbroken over the death of his wife. And later on, I think it's in like season two, like partway through season two, or it might be season three, um, there's a conversation between Susan and her father. Her, fa her father's on his deathbed. Um, I think he has cancer or something along those lines. And... I think it's a few weeks or a few days later, he actually succumbs to the cancer and dies. Another interesting aspect about um, Susan, and this is only mentioned a handful of times or maybe a couple of times, and there's only one actual episode that it's um, explored, is the fact that she is, in fact, Jewish. Um, her mother, if, I'm, if I recall correctly, it's her mother that was Jewish, not so much her father. But after... Her mother committing suicide and her father dying of cancer. Susan has a falling out in, within her with her faith, um, and she, at one point, um, it's one of her dis. I think it's 
I think it's a distant relative, if it's not a distant relative, it's a close family friend who is actually a Jewish rabbi. And he comes to the station to visit Susan and everything. I think it's a, a few months or so after her father passes because it takes such a long time to get from Earth all the way out to Babylon 5 because it is a very far out, out outpost. But the um, the the uh, the family friend and everything, he comes to visit uh, Susan there on the station and he wants her to do something calling sitting Shiva. Or she, she, I think I'm pronouncing it correctly, but basically it's a, um, it's kind of along the lines of a, of a wake, a remembrance of those that have passed on, those that have died, and the rabbi and the, fa and the, the family and friends of the departed and of the, 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 those that are in mourning or anything come to pay respect to and remember the, the, those that have passed on. But Susan hasn't done this. She hasn't gone through this ritual. And the family friend is very concerned about this. And he actually goes to, um, if I remember correctly, he goes to Sheridan and says, hey, Susan, um, how he's, what he calls her, Sujinska, has not said Shiva. And I'm concerned for her. Now, I might be getting my lines crossed up. But I'm pretty sure it is Sheridan that the uh, the rabbi talks to. It's not Sinclair, because Sinclair has already shipped out. Um, because Sheridan and Sinclair have a much closer relationship. Shared Ivanova and Sheridan have a much closer relationship than Sinclair and Ivanova did. And Sheridan is able to talk to Ivanova and say, "Hey, look, you need to go." You, you do what you feel you need to. I'm not going to push you, but your friend has come to me and said, hey, he's worried about you. He's concerned. And at first, Susan is very resistant to this idea because she does still have very negative feelings about her father and their relationship. But just before the, um, the rabbi ends up leaving, Susan comes and catches him and says, hey, I want to do this. Well, he said Shiva with me. And the rabbi says, of course I will. And I think that's a very interesting insight to Ivan, uh, Ivanova's personality because while she's not a deep person of faith, she realizes that she has lost someone. She has lost her father. She's lost her last remaining family member and everything, immediate family member because her, her brother died during the Earth Membrane War. Her mother commits suicide. Her father dies uh, due to cancer. And... She very much has closed, closed herself off, and this is a common theme throughout the series. Ivanova keeps to herself. She doesn't open up very much around very many people, and when she does, it's only with those that she truly implicitly trusts. And I think that's something here. I also think that's an interesting uh, characteristic of Ivanova. But later on, um, obviously she goes through the ceremony, and she mourns. She grieves over her father, and she, I think in her own way she comes to a place where she's able to forgive her father for how he treated her. And he, she remembers a couple of the um, conversations that they have by um, long distance communication. It's a, it's a video conference type thing. And he rem she remembers what, his, what her father was trying to say to her, that a father should show his daughter love. And he didn't do that in the way that he should have with her. And she realizes her father did love her he just had a hard time of expressing it. And I think that's something that is honestly actually commonplace even nowadays, but it's something that was very commonplace back in the 1940s, 1950s. You had men that grew up in those in those decades. They loved their wives, they loved their children, but they would had a very difficult time expressing that affection, expressing that love openly because for some, they might have been raised in a home where that wasn't very commonplace. I think exploring the dynamic between Eva, Susan and her father was a really good way of coming to terms and exploring that dynamic. And I think because obviously some people have this image, and honestly I think it's not a completely accurate image, of what the Russian people are like. And I think this very much 
breaks down those walls, not of just how men have been portrayed so often as being emotionless or emotionally closed off. It isn't so much that men were emotionally closed off, they just didn't know how to express their feelings openly. They didn't have those tools or those skills. So, but getting back into uh, Ivanova's story, um, it's during the Shadow War and everything and the lead up to it that she takes on a much bigger role and everything. Uh, she's not just um, a commander on the station, but she actually becomes a member. She becomes a commander and she actually becomes um, something of a... Uh, I don't want to say this. She becomes what they call the voice of the resistance and the voice of the war and everything between the um, all the younger races and the shadows. And she and periodically during the series and everything, in particular during the the uh, storyline of the Shadow War, you would see her on screen and everything discussing the current events and so on, and uh, making announcements about systems that were safe that refugees could escape to, and so on. And she did something similar in the storyline of the um, the Civil War and everything with Earth between um, the. I hate, to, I hate to say it, the rebels and the Clark administration, uh, President Clark. Um, and I'll go and I will go into the, uh, the, uh, the Earth Civil War or anything within the um, Earth Force. Because that's a really complex and interesting um, storyline within the Babylon 5 universe. But what, what Ivanova ends up doing, she actually starts going out on missions and everything um, with, the, uh, with the rangers. And um, one ranger in particular that I mentioned before, Marcus Cole, he develops um, feelings for Susan. Um, and they are very deep, emotional, very romantic feelings for her. And at a point and everything, um, they get through the Shadow War, and Marcus survives, and Susan, well, Ivanova survives as well. And during the uh, the Air Force uh, Civil War, uh, the war, what they call the war against Clark, um, there's a big battle between the um, the forces that are trying to set Earth free and remove Clark from office. And there's some special forces that are under Clark's command that uh, Sus that Susan Ivanova leads a uh, strike force against. And Marcus is um, one, her second in command on one of the ships and everything that's uh, in this in this fight. And what ends up happening, sadly, is they destroy the the uh, the, uh, the opposing force. But unfortunately, there's a bit of wreckage that comes hurtling towards the ship that Ivanova and Marcus Cole are on. And it pretty much obliterates the ship. Life support is, the ship is severely damaged. And Susan is on the bridge of the ship. And the wreckage crashes right into the bridge. And Marcus is right there with her. And what ends up happening is Marcus evacs her to another ship that isn't damaged. They've got her on life support. And she's, when you see her, she's in bad, bad shape. I mean, um... She's even beyond the aid of Mimbari technology and Mimbari medicine, which is is very advanced or anything, even beyond what uh, the human uh, medical technology has advanced to. What ends up happening is Marcus becomes obsessed with saving Ivanova's life, and he um, starts going through all the records and everything, trying to find some way of saving Ivanova's life, and he comes across this device that was actually introduced in Season 1. And um, there's this doctor who's operating um, off the books on Babylon 5, and she has access to this device or anything that will take the life force from one person and transfer it to another to heal wounds or sicknesses or what have you. And Marcus gets his hands on, uh, takes Susan's body, takes a ship, and goes back to Babylon 5. And... Um, some of the staff and everything in the med bay try to stop him. He incapacitates him, doesn't kill him because Marcus is a ranger and he's sworn enough, obviously, not to take life unless he absolutely has to. And he doesn't have to here. He just incapacitates everybody. He locates the machine 
and he hooks himself and Ivanova up to it. What ends up happening is Marcus leaves the machine hooked up for so long that it does save Ivanova's life, but unfortunately it takes his life. And you have this other scene after the fact with Ivanova and the doctor um, that's on the station, Stephen Franklin. And they're sitting there in the med bay. Marcus's uh, body is on a on a, on a uh, gurney or whatever, and his head's covered. And she's sitting there absolutely, Ivanova's sitting there absolutely rimwrecked. And up, as always, for all this stuff that I'm talking about, I will include links to the important scenes or anything that I'm that uh, help lay out the storyline here for Ivanova. But you see her, she's absolutely in. She's inconsolable, she's in tears, and she's talking with Franklin, and she says, I knew that he loved me, I knew that he cared about me, and I knew how far that love went, and she's like, I was laying there on the, on the table and everything, and he, I just looked over and I saw him, and she's like, I was going in and out of consciousness, and she's like, I heard a voice say, I love you, and she thought, it was God's voice, but when, it, and she's like, he did have a British accent, like in all those old movies. And, um, she's like, she says to Franklin, all the other men that I ever met in my life, she's like, there was no depth to them. There was nothing really important about them. They just wanted me because, well, if, let's be, let's be candid here. Susan Ivanova was a very beautiful woman. And everything and um, what ends up happening is she just absolutely breaks down in front of Franklin and I think she's very vulnerable in this moment and she's like I should have at least to quote Ivanova here she's like I should have at least boffed him once and everything and I think y'all can get what she was saying and Franklin kind of chuckles and looks back at her and says, did you just say boff? She's like, yeah. She's like, it sounded like something he, Marcus would have said. <laughs> and she's like, I should have given him a chance. And now he's gone and I can't. And your heart just absolutely breaks for her in that moment. Because Marcus Cole was one of the truly most decent and most honorable men that you see portrayed on the show. And um, it's honestly very sad because this is a man, he was a ranger. He was a member of the Anla Shock. And he had dedicated his life to being a member of the Anla Shock. And much like Sinclair, now I'm not saying this is the case of the mayor, but to kind of paint a picture for Marcus Cole, he was human, but he had the mind of a Membari. As far as we know, he didn't, he wasn't one of those that was born with a Membari soul, he, but he very much embodied the ideals of the very best of what humanity had become and what the Rangers stood for. And at a certain point within the TV show, you see Ivanova just kind of disappear. And the reasoning that they give, and I think it's a very good explanation for why she kind of drops out of the story, is she is so heartbroken over the loss of Marcus that she leaves Babylon 5 because that's where he does die. And she takes up another position later on down the, down the road with Earth, Earth Force. She's like a colonel or something along those lines. And you see her, and she's sitting behind a desk, and she is just absolutely miserable because, yeah, she's gotten to this higher rank. She's happy, relatively speaking, but she wants to do more. And towards the end of the series and everything, I think it's like the second to the second to last or very last episode, um, you see her putting on the uniform of the Rangers. And that kind of sort of, that kind of rounds out her arc. She becomes a member of the Rangers. She become I don't think she becomes a ring. I think she becomes a, a leader within the Rangers after Sheridan um, 
and I'll go into share it another time. I don't want to spoil anything here for those of you who don't know. But Sheridan eventually stand, steps down as leader of the Rangers, and I think Ivanova takes his place. But I think the reason, I think her reasoning for doing this is she wants to dedicate her life, the remainder of how many years, however many years she has left, to working in an organization that the one man that genuinely loved her and cared for her so much, she wants to work within that organization. And I think, honestly, that's a very commendable and a very, very cool thing for her to do. Uh, the last reference you have to Ivanova in the TV show, and this is actually in season four. It's I think towards it's at I think it's like the last or second to last episode of season four, and the episode's called the deconstruction of falling stars. And this episode goes far off into the future, like several thousand years after all the events of the TV show and all the TV movies that they did. And you have a scene and everything where you see these like two medieval monks, for lack of a better, well, I think that's a fairly decent uh, uh, representation of who these guys are. And you have this one um, monk coming to, I think, like the abbot, the head of the um, monastery and saying, I've done more work on my compilation here of all the history and everything going on. And he refers to... Uh, Susan Ivanova as Ivanova the Strong, and I think that kind of is a, is a good representation of who Susan was, of who Ivanova, of who Susan Ivanova was. She was very strong. She was very proud, but not prideful. And I think the fact that they dedicate a portion of this chronology or whatever it is that this monk, this young monk, is working on to her is a testament to her legacy and everything in the B5 universe. So, that all being said, I hope you all enjoyed this. I know I'm enjoying it. I know I'm enjoying bringing you all this content. Um, as always, if you like what I'm doing, uh, like, share, and subscribe, and by all means, uh, comment. Um, I will be uploading another video later today or tomorrow, um, continuing my uh, 1980s retrospective. Uh, I've got an idea. I hope it's one that y'all enjoy. So until then, as our friend Ambassador Kosh likes to say.